Welcome to JAG Talk, a podcast series featuring Navy JAG community experts. Listen to in-depth discussions about different legal fields and hear insights and lessons learned from practitioners across our enterprise. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of our podcast. I'm Lieutenant Greg Lines. Today's episode is going to be a good one, folks. We've put together an all-star lineup of guests who are coming to answer, inter alia, the question, VLCs, where are they now? Make sure your headphones are charged. Here we go. All right. Well, my next guest today is uh, Lieutenant Commander Jared Franks, uh, who's joining us from Arlington, Virginia. Welcome, uh, Lieutenant Commander Franks. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, there may or there may not be a conspiracy afoot. Um, So you are also a a native of Phoenix, Arizona. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, I went to Brophy uh, College Preparatory right in central Phoenix. So I swam against Brophy and it was one of the most soul crushing experiences of my life. (laughs) Yeah, they had a they still have a bit of a dynasty there. But, um, you know, I had no idea, you know, Arizona being landlocked and all that we'd have a, a fairly decent sized footprint. Um, in the Navy JAG Corps of uh, fellow Arizonans. I know we got a couple of folks from Tucson and, and a couple of folks from Phoenix. And uh, it's good. I, you know, I tend to think it's very highly we, of, uh, we all try to escape the uh, the heat in the desert, right? And so yeah, it's, it's yeah. the service where we can't go back. <laughs> yeah, you find out about uh, all these bases near near beaches and in cooler climates and uh, you jump at the chance. So, you know, Phoenix, terribly hot, but we love it. Kind of moving to um, your background, could you kind of just walk us through real quick, um, kind of your JAG Corps journey? Like, what um, what what jobs have you had uh, up to this point? So I uh, started out in uh, Bremerton at the the Navy Legal Service Office, the NILSO, um, and at the time, um, first first job was legal assistance, and I did a little bit of defense work. And at about the year mark, I volunteered to go on an uh, on an IA. Uh, to Afghanistan, uh, went to uh, CJ at 435 for about nine months and followed that uh, first tour uh, by going to the Regional Legal Service Office in Japan, now real so Westpac, and was a prosecutor for a year, trial counsel, and then served as the um, the assistant um, judge advocate to Commander Naval Forces Japan. And then from there, I went to Naval Special Warfare, I has always wanted to, you know, after being in Afghanistan, wanted to um, work work alongside them because we we had worked you know some of the cases that they had brought some of the detainees they had brought to us in Afghanistan so wanted to see uh, what that community was like and served uh, with uh, Naval Special Warfare Group Two in Virginia Beach for for two years deployed a couple times to Africa um, doing some security assistance um, deployments in in Eastern Africa based out of Djibouti and from there um, you know I was. Um, newly married uh, to another judge advocate, and she was stationed at the at the Naval Academy on staff there. Um, and and at the time we were you know on about to detail, and they came to me with this opportunity to uh, to join VLC. Um, wasn't sure at the time if that was you know the right decision for me, um, given that I had a, you know interest in doing more national security law, but talked to some folks and they thought it would be an awesome opportunity and, and looked at, looked at the opportunities for, for Joey and, and, and me to, to live together. And they dangled uh, a little slice of paradise called uh, Pearl Harbor in front of us both. And we decided to jump at the chance. And, and that's how I ended up at VLC for three years. More about that. But um, following on VLC, I went to school at Georgetown for an LLM and then went to a carrier strike group and did that for two years. And, and, and now I'm at uh, the Navy Office of Legislative Affairs serving as a legislative counsel and liaison. Wow, that quite quite, quite the history. Um, and uh, it's interesting to note, you know, Pearl Harbor, it gets you every time. <laughs> well, without further ado, um, let's kind of dig into some of um, our questions for today. Um, so when you were told that you were going to be um, a victim's legal counsel, um, h- how did you feel about that? What were your kind of first impressions? Admittedly, I was was a little nervous. Hadn't been in court in quite a while. Hadn't really represented a whole lot of clients in, in any capacity. I had had some defense, um, 
some time with defense in my first tour, but most of it were most of it was just uh, purse reps, the occasional ad set board, and I, and you know I think I went into court once or twice, and, you know, for dives and things of that nature. I hadn't done a contested court martial, and I had done a couple as a as a trial counsel, but it, but it had been years, and I understood that the practice was new. Um, the law was to some degree, you know being made as as we went i know some of the predecessors in the program were really you know the plank owners were the ones that really helped shape the law and, and our ability to practice in court but i knew it was going to be a challenge um and i didn't have the the background in litigation so i was admittedly a little bit nervous um but i thought the opportunity to represent clients and and, and to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with folks and, and to be able to help them was was something that interested me. Uh, it was it was an opportunity that I knew that as a lawyer, I think all of us at some point want to be able to make a difference. And, you know, direct representation offers you that. So that part excited me. But uh, I, you know, would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous and, and to some degree scared to, to, to get back in there and, and be the one person representing somebody that's that's really relying on you. Right. Yeah. So kind of a little bit of mixed emotions. Um, what did you find to be kind of the most appealing things about uh, the job for you? I got to I got to say that the idea that that the JAG Corps was entrusting me and others to go and it was a high visibility program. It was a challenge, and that we had a lot of folks looking at what we were doing, and and while they were very much supportive of our success. I, I think that, you know, the challenge of it, just, hey, like the eyes are going to be on you and your colleagues to get this right and to represent clients and their needs and, and to make sure that you guys are fighting for them every day. Um, that part was an, it was inspiring, but it was it absolutely interested me. Like I, I wanted to be part of something that was new. I, I liked the idea that there was still folks that were kind of detracting from the program. I think that I don't know if that's, I don't think that that's still the case. I think that there's overwhelming respect for what everybody is doing for, for victims and for the program and, and for the Navy and, and our mission of, of, uh, of helping sailors. But I think at the time there was detractors and I like the idea of kind of being on the opposite end of that and to, you know, the idea that you're going to be able to prove people wrong, that, that, that we have a place within the JAG or within the Navy and that, that it's going to be um, a critical part of the practice of what we do. And I absolutely wanted to be uh, part of that, supporting it, driving it forward. Definitely is is something that that would be appealing. Um, kind of high stakes, right? Um, very visible, high stakes, and and very meaningful, kind of on the individual level, um, like you were saying. So um, dur during your experience with the program, um, what were some of like the biggest challenges that you faced um, personally? Like, did you, um, you know? Was the work itself difficult? Um, did you find that um, there were, you know, unique legal challenges? Um, kind of what was your experience that way? I would say that, again, uh, certainly rusty and, and by no means an expert in, in litigation. Um, I think ultimately we have our, our strengths, our weaknesses and, and the things that we're practiced in. And, you know, we were serving with some folks that were no kidding, hotshot litigators, me not being one of them. Um, so I think just I probably had a larger learning curve. I absolutely had a larger learning curve than some of my peers. Um, you know, as we're talking about trial strategy, you know, victims legal counsel have trial strategies as well. You know, they're they're limited in scope, but at the end of the day, you have to find out based on what your client asks you to do, directs you to do as you know the person in charge. How am I going to achieve those goals? A lot of times, it's not even in the litigation, but a lot of times, you know, when, when the direction is that they want to be able to achieve a certain result in litigation, it's, it's your job as the expert, you know, as their lawyer to, to try and get it done. Um, so the challenge for me was to kind of get back into that mindset to, to, to get back into a field that I was not as familiar with as some of my peers and, and to achieve those things. And, and I, and I can tell you, it, it wasn't always easy, but thankfully there was a, a great support network and there was a lot of smart people, much smarter than me, that I could always rely on to to help me um, with sanity checks and to to give uh, very, uh, very good advice when I didn't always see um, the clearest path or I couldn't diagnose it myself. When I think what we've heard um, earlier today, everybody brings different strengths and experience to the program, right? So uh, for someone like yourself, right, maybe you were able to help 
other other VLCs who had less SJA experience, because um, a lot of, of the work happens outside of the courtroom, right? And and working with um, clients and their commands and whatnot. Um, so d- was that your experience as well? Kind of like there's a there's a give and take from everybody, kind of with different experiences and and specialties. I certainly like to think that that was the case. I mean, there was times where where folks reached out and and having an understanding of I guess to some degree the fleet mindset for for lack of a better term does inform, you know, a trial strategy, doesn't, uh, does inform an engagement strategy, because a lot of times we are advocating with commands outside of, outside of the courtroom, trying to get things done before, you know, it gets to a charging phase or a court martial phase, or even when you're just advocating on behalf of your client for something that the command um, controls. Um, I, I believe having that SJA experience, having that background, working with the fleet, absolutely, I think was a skill set that that helped me, and and I try to leverage in helping others. Um, and also just understanding how those folks think on the operational side, I think will lead to to better and and more fruitful conversations and, and advocacy. And and I'm hopeful at least I can speak to all the times that I was helped. I, I'd like to think that there was times that that I reciprocated that all all the assistance I got um, from others. Um, so I, I think after three years, that would be my greatest hope aside from the fact that my clients that, you know, that they felt that, that I helped push the ball forward for them, that, that I was also able to push the ball forward, um, or support my, my peers pushing the ball forward, um, fellow VLCs. Yeah. And in terms of the work itself, kind of the, the daily grind of it, um, did you feel that that like kind of weighed on you over time? Was it something that was easy to, um, to manage or did you, did you struggle with that at all? I mean, there's always tough days at the office. There was times where, where things didn't work out um, as you hope they would, or as, as your client hoped that they would. I, I, three years in the program, you're going to have um, wins and, and some losses, um, good days and bad days. I would say that the chain of command that I had at the time was, was incredible. Um, we always, um, had a very collegial atmosphere in the office. I had, uh, at the time, Lieutenant Commander, then Commander Jen Fraser as my OIC. Um, before I moved up to the OIC role, I had, you know, Liz Jarzik and, and Yokosuka. Um, and, um, you know, great folks all over the country, back Conus, Charlotte Clavarius, um, people that, I mean, legitimately were always there when you needed something. So I think the work-life balance and, and the ability to talk to folks through challenging times, um, alleviated some of the difficulty, but yeah, there undoubtedly was, there was tough days. I mean, granted, you know, not everybody had the opportunity to go run on the beach in Hawaii to, to clear their head, like, like the folks in, uh, in Pearl did, but, um, you know, I, I you know, there's, you're dealing with heavy stuff. You're dealing with clients that are traumatized and and that transfers to you, especially when you feel that, you know, you really want to achieve something on their behalf. And and if you fell short, um, there was times that, you know, that weighed on me. Um, Some sleepless nights, some, some times that I just, you know, wished I could go back in time and and change a decision or or strategize a little differently. I I think that's any job, but the, the, the human aspect of this job, I think weighs a little heavier. Yeah. And and now as you kind of look back on it, um, how did VLC um, play a role in kind of the rest of your career trajectory? Well, it certainly taught me a, a lot of humility, um, healthy dose of humility for a lot of reasons, right? It just puts things in perspective. Um, when I mentioned having bad days at the office, I, I would venture to say that I never had a day that was as bad as, as some of the days that my clients went through, um, certainly went through. And the aftermath of, of the trauma they were exposed to. Um, so it gave me a perspective. It, it taught me a lot of empathy. Um, and I'd like to think that coming into the program, I didn't have an empathy deficit, but I certainly gained the ability to empathize and to, to see people for the struggles that they bring to the table. Um, and I think that helped me as a leader when just, you know, engaging with sailors and peers and even superiors in terms of, you know, when, when somebody comes to a conversation or an engagement and you might not necessarily be um, on the same plane or there might be difficulty in communication, you know, it's it's taught me how to look a little deeper and, and, and try to understand where a person is coming from and, and perhaps the, the genesis of 
why they feel a certain way about a topic. Like it, it just has, it, it's, it's taught me the humility and the, the empathy to, to look at the people that I engage with and, and under, try to understand them so that I can more effectively communicate for them. And, and, and that helps in whatever advocacy or engagement I'm doing in, in all my current jobs. And, and I don't think I ever got it to the, to the extent that I, that, you know, I was able to um, learn uh, from, from those experiences in BLC. And looking back, um, for you specifically as, as kind of more of the SJ type, um, how did you feel that the experience aided or, you know, um, enriched your kind of toolkit um, as a staff judge advocate? I think absolutely. Just from the get-go, it's a credibility builder. When, when folks know that you have that in your background, um, people understand that you've done something different. Um and in a lot of the work we do now at, at OLA um, or even advising folks at the strike group when we're talking about sex assault investigations, they, they know that, that, that I've worked in, in now every aspect of it and I've seen all the different sides. So they know when I am advising on something like that, that, that I'm able to calculate and scrutinize kind of all positions on that um, defense, government and, and, and the victim. Um, and it's certainly in my current job at, at OLA, we deal a lot in sexual assault policy, um, sexual harassment policy, um, and we just deal in a lot of issues that impact sailors. And, and I think having that experience working directly with sailors, some of the ones that have been through some of the greatest trauma, you know, it, it just brings a certain credibility to the table. Like I've worked amongst this. I've, I've helped folks that are going through this. Um but most importantly, it drives me not to forget those folks that, you know, that there's still advocacy for the folks that need our help the most in leadership positions to, to continue advocating for them to, you know, you've seen the worst of what can happen to somebody. Um, and that, you know, I've had leaders that say, never forget those experiences when you're at the table talking to folks, because you can still advocate for them. You can still try and make their situation better, even if you're not detailed to them as counsel, because you know their perspective and, and you know that that those that that trauma is real and it's impacting um, what they are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And it informs what they may need to, to help them get back and, and to get to a state of readiness and, and to get back into the fight fully functioning. Um, for, for people who are maybe considering doing a tour as a VLC, um, what, what would your advice be to them uh, in whether or not to, to take that position? I would say, you know, I would say don't hesitate, but first evaluate where you are at um, in your life and in your career. And I think we always hope that we, that we can all aspire and, and, and work towards being a servant leader. But if you are not in a position where you're able to be that servant leader, that, that you are willing to, to truly invest yourself in being the full-time advocate for the people that you are about to represent, you should consider that, you know, it might not be the right time for you because I think to succeed in this job, you have to have that as the foundation. You have to be willing to say that, that, that these folks, I'm going to put them first and you know, I think they deserve that type of commitment. And, and I think if you are willing and able to do that, the job will be all the more rewarding. and You'll be able to achieve what I think that, that folks hope for when, when they set this program up um, and they launched it. I, I frankly think that if, if those are questions that you've been able to ask yourself and answer in a positive way, there's, there shouldn't be anything holding you back because it's so rewarding. Um, and more importantly, like I can't speak to the community there, but I suspect it's 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 one of the best groups we have in the JAG Corps because it's it's I assume people that are all of the like mindset that they're ready to serve, they're ready to move the ball forward, and and they're ready to make the Navy a better place for the folks that need it the most, and that makes for a hell of a command and, and a hell of a community to work with. And, and I think it's it's interesting this idea of it's really important if you're considering that that billet that it's not just about you right it can't just be wh what am i going to get out of this um and and kind of you have to maintain the perspective of what am i doing for these people how how can i use that experience to to you know grow personally 
but instead of viewing it as like a box to check or, um, you know, what am I getting out of it? Do your best where you are, right? You make the most of the opportunity that you have. And the way that you do that in that job is is really caring about the people that you are representing. Yeah, I think that that's a fair, more than fair way of, uh, of framing it. It's true. I mean, ultimately, we are there to provide a service to folks that need it. And that's foundational. And if, if, if that is not your primary commitment to the job, I, I don't know necessarily that you're a good fit, but if it is, you know, the world is your oyster. It's going to be an awesome, it's going to be an awesome tour. You're going to be surrounded by awesome people doing an, a critical mission and, and you're going to grow and become a better leader, a better advocate. And, and I think a better person from, from doing it. So for you, I mean, you were already in OIC, so there's not really anything that you could come back to um, VLC P and, and, and do, right? Um, except maybe, you know, at a higher echelon. But, um, w- you know, hypothetically speaking, one day, um, would, would that be something that you were interested in coming coming back to the program? I've already talked to Charlotte Clavarius. If there's ever an opportunity for me to go back, she needs to absolutely let me know. Um I tell folks this, and it's not a platitude. I, I think once you're part of the VLC family, you're a member for life. And and I think that, like I said, there's adv- advocacy you can do on behalf of the program, whether it's recruiting good folks um, or finding ways when you're at a position like OLA to continue driving the mission forward, whether it's advocating for the things that the program may need. Um, singing its praises to folks that might not yet be familiar with the value that it adds, or if an opportunity comes up in the department where there's policy that 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 might drive the ball forward on behalf of victims or behalf of the the victims legal counsel, you, you know you do it. So you're you're I think you're a team member for life. It's 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 a fantastic group. It's a unique group. It's a practice that didn't even exist when I joined the Navy, but so glad that it did. And, and frankly, if the opportunity to come back um, was there, I, I imagine that I would, I would think long and hard about doing it and, and would probably find myself headed back if we've given the opportunity. So um, as the program comes into its um, kind of 10-year ten, ten anniversary, um, do you have any kind of thoughts, perspectives you want to share on um, kind of how the program has been and, and, and where it is today? Well, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that from its inception to where we are now, it's grown. Uh, the fleet sees the value in it. Uh, it's increased in billets and it's increased in mission. The feedback that, that we got when I was in the program, and I suspect that they still get, is that there's a high, extremely high amount of victim satisfaction, client satisfaction, that people are saying that they are glad that that they have retained victims legal counsel to support them. Um, and that the program adds inven- immense value. Um, and I think that that has only grown with time. Um, but what is most telling is that the mission has expanded, you know, from, you know, it's first year to now, you know, probably double the, uh, billets, you know, the domestic violence piece of the mission. Um, I, I just think that ultimately that those speak to the value that has been added and, and that, that, that the mission not only is needed, but it's appreciated at, at the highest levels of um, the Department of Defense. And, and I think that expansion is, is pretty much across the board for all the services. But speaking to the Navy, I mean, the, the expansion is real. Um, mission people um, and as a result, sailors that have been that have benefited most importantly. Well, sir, um, thank you again so much for um, you know taking time out of your day to um, talk with us and share your perspective. Um, it, it's so fascinating to hear kind of um, experience of everybody from from the different periods that that they served, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to see good things as we um, go into the second decade of the program. Well, thank you for having me. It was certainly my pleasure. And- You have been listening to JAG Talk, a podcast series featuring Navy JAG community experts. Visit jag.navy.mil for additional chapters of this podcast series. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you.